Coming up on DTNS, it's not UCES, it's Omicron. Whose responsibility is it not to play solitaire while driving after all? And I'll explain the things you need to know about log for shell as the great December patch march continues. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, December 22nd, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In the snowbound Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. There is a longer version of this show where you get our opinions about more than just what's in the show. It's called Good Day Internet. It's available at patreon.com slash DTNS. By the way, big thanks to our top patrons, including Norm Fizikas, Chris Allen, and Mark Gibson. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Sony Pictures Networks India announced a merger with Z Entertainment that will form the second largest entertainment network in India behind Disney Hotstar. Post-merger, the company will have over 75 TV channels, a large collection of film assets, and two streaming platforms. Browser maker Vivaldi announced a partnership with Polestar to bring the first browser to Android Automotive OS. The browser will come to the Polestar 2, include tabbed browsing, support for media streaming, an ad blocker, and sync with other Vivaldi browsers. Vivaldi plans to expand support to more cars eventually. According to Cloudflare's top domains ranking, TikTok.com was the most popular domain from September to December of 2021, up from seven, uh, the seven uh, spot last year and surpassing Google.com. So quite a lift for TikTok.com. Instagram.com fell out of the top 10 in late 2021, not even in it, with fellow meta domain WhatsApp climbing into the top 10 for the first time. Uh, a moment uh, to acknowledge the passing of Google.com's lead. In this. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah, I know. Big deal. Pour out a little yeah. liquor. The Google Voice web app now lets you create custom rules for responding to incoming calls from specific contacts. This includes forwarding specific contacts to linked numbers or sending contacts directly to voicemail. Last week, Best Buy pulled TCL's Google uh, TV 5 Series and 6 Series models from store shelves, citing performance issues. TCL has since confirmed it's rolling out a software update to its entire Google TV lineup to provide significant performance improvements. And as a result, Best Buy resumed sales of the models of the updates. All right. Last January, January 2020, CES 2020 was all virtual. Vaccines were just starting to be delivered. Treatments were in their earliest stages. This year's CES is a hybrid. Now, there are some virtual events for those who do not wish to attend in person, but in-person events in Las Vegas are scheduled as well. And it just got a little more virtual in the face of the spread of the Omicron variant. T-Mobile, Meta, Twitter, Pinterest, and iHeartRadio all announced this week they will not attend CES in person, or at least in large part. T-Mobile CEO Mike Sievert, in fact, will no longer offer his keynote in person or virtually. Uh, although T-Mobile still intends to be part of CES as a sponsor, uh, they are pulling out of the in-person stuff, and I guess they couldn't put it together to do the virtual keynote. Samsung, GM, LG, Panasonic, and Sony are all still attending as of now, although LG already planned to use QR codes and augmented reality to show off its products. They did not have a traditional booth. Bloomberg sources say Amazon will not send people, though AMD, Qualcomm, OnePlus, and HTC all still plan to attend, according to Bloomberg. Samsung and Google have both said officially they are monitoring local conditions, which gives them both a chance to pull out at any time if they decide. The CTA issued a statement Wednesday saying, at this point, we're very much focused on having this show and doing it safely and putting the right protocols in place to ensure that people feel comfortable with it. CES requires attendees to have two vaccination shots and recommends testing for COVID before departure and within 24 hours of attending a venue in Las Vegas. CES starts with press previews on January 3rd and officially opens on January 5th. I mean, it's easy to see this and go, ah, man, just right when we were about to get it better, we went weird again. And that's kind of where we're at. But you know, if I remember back here in 2020 uh, CES, that year didn't seem surprising that a lot of, you know, uh, restrictions are put in place. Things became virtual. Like it just felt like, well, that's the year of 2020 and maybe 2021 because we're talking about January. But I think everybody thought in their heart of hearts that 
maybe a whole year from now, we'll have just a better time. This will work better. We're not going to have to face some whole new outbreak or whatever. And it really, really bums me out, given the, rip the, the rapidity of this, this most recent threat and how quickly people are having to react. Reading this makes me just a little just a little more sad than I would be usually. Yeah, I mean, I think last year was a wash. Um, a lot of us felt that way, you know, a, as disappointed as we were. But this year felt like, okay, well, there's all sorts of ways that everybody can be safe and make sure that, you know, if they're going to be, you know, in a place somewhere with a lot of other people, uh, you know, for the love of technology, then we're we're in we're in a good spot. And so I wonder how much the these companies saying, you know what, we don't feel comfortable and we're going to pull out is going to be any sort of, a, you know, a, 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 an effect to other companies who haven't yet made some sort of, you know, a line in the sand about it. Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting close enough to the holiday break that I feel like this is the crest of that wave, right? Like it, you, you, you saw on Tuesday, basically, uh, uh, the the end of the avalanche. There had been a few announcements earlier in the week, and then T-Mobile came out, and and then and the Bloomberg report about Amazon. And and so I think this became sort of the, the line in the sand, I think, was Wednesday. I, that, that's my guess, anyway. I maybe proved wrong. Maybe, maybe first of the year we'll get a couple more at the last minute pull out. But you kind of have to – you have to change your plans now – uh, in order to to really you know be able to like get refunds and cancel contracts. But and all you that also sort of have thing. these company, you know, big companies, you know, yeah. Meta, Twitter, Pinterest, uh, you know, saying it's not worth it. And so, what is that going to do to a company who's like, well, we're already sending everybody there, and let's still do it anyway, and well, then I, I, deal with the repercussions? Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that has happened, and now we've seen who's going to go like, yeah, no, we probably shouldn't do that either, and who's saying. I think this can be done safely. Uh, Omicron appears to be mild, uh, and and even even so, you have to be vaccinated. We we feel confident and taking stock of their employees. I, I don't think you're going to see a lot of employees change their minds. So then 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 the or, or companies change their minds. So then the question becomes: Are they making a mistake? Uh, and and to me, I'm hoping. Yeah. I don't know. Neither one. None of us know. But I'm hoping that it ends up not being a mistake that this ends up uh being the protocols are are good uh the attendance is is low enough that you you don't have spread maybe even omicron turns out not to be as lethal and deadly as as it uh was feared uh, some of the early uh research seems to indicate that so you know fingers crossed that this ends up not being a problem on on the practical side of it i don't think it changes anything we're going to get all the announcements and we're going to be covering it and, uh, you know, we right now we're sending a couple people there. We'll we may change our minds on that ourselves. We've got a little more flexibility than a large company does. But uh, but, yeah, I I don't think it'll change what news comes out of CES. Really. Well, if you're looking for cool display news, I have some right now. So you don't have to wait for CES, although I'm sure this might get shown off. Or was LG one of the ones that pulled out? Now I'm losing track of who's who. Anyway, LG announced the 27 inch dual uh, excuse me, dual up monitor. You guys are going to love this with a unique 16 by 18 aspect ratio. That sounds weird because it kind of is. It looks like two 16.9 monitors stacked vertically. Okay, so imagine you putting those in that formation, except this is one full display. It offers 2560 by 2880 resolution, 300 nits of brightness, and supports USB C power. Uh, delivery to devices of up to 86 watts. So that's pretty cool in a daisy chain scenario. LG says the dual up will give you the same screen real estate as two 21.5 inch displays and has a vertical split view function that lets users see more in one glance. Uh, that's a direct quote. And it, it attaches to LG's included ergo stand, uh, which can clamp to some desks and tables uh, as a space saver. Usually that's something you have to get extra. So that's kind of nice. LG claims the display also helps quote, reduce side-to-side -side head movements, the main cause of neck pain. Uh, I can relate to this. It also has two HDMI ports, one upstream USB-C port for your computer, of course, and two downstream USB-C USB ports, uh, but they aren't Thunderbolt ports. It's an important uh, thing to note. No word on any pricing or availability, but I can tell you somebody who's always in the market for cool uh, ways to handle more production 
uh, with screens and the like. This seems pretty neat. I like it. Yeah, we were just talking about this. Uh, the DTNS crew was talking about how you know how how we all look at you know our Skype window when we're doing the show, for example, and also handling Discord and you know our Twitter feeds and all the other things that you might ha- want to have open. I have one very large monitor. Um, it's a 28 inch. It's big. Um, but, uh, what's, what's great about the LG monitor is you look at it and you kind of go, Oh gosh, that's totally different. Um, it's longer than it is wide, but then you think, well, okay, if I had a couple of those now I'm really in business because you, you basically have now given yourself four monitors and in you know in the event that you need to have something like is super wide that's you know maybe it's not for you but otherwise i think as far as uh like a you know a creative situation is going this is it's pretty cool yeah it's rad if i had my way i would do this here this is just scott's idea no one has to adhere to my ideas but i'd go ultra wide in front of me and i do one of these to the left of me or to the right of me and have mm-hmm. that double stacked feature there because so much of the time that's where a second monitor is anyway. It's a great place for staging everything and having stuff running that I don't need to mess with or have windows come in front of. Maybe I'm capturing screen, whatever. And in many like, ways, yeah. it's a scrolling thing, right? So the, the vertical nature of it makes more sense than having some uh, other big monitor that you have to make space for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. It's so funny. This news broke uh, shortly after uh, my wife uh, called me, and she's like, "What do you think of this?" And she she had a two monitor set up, two twenty seven inch monitors, I think, and she had taken one of them and made it vertical, so that it's it's portrait mode. And she had her company email and her company Slack on that, uh, and it was kind of the same idea, right? It's just narrower because it's a it's a normal monitor. But right. I, I when as soon as I saw this, I'm like, oh well, she could totally use this for that to have that scrolling like you're talking about, you know, like your your scrolling Slack, your scrolling email, be compartmentalized, separate visually from whatever you're working on, whether it's editing or looking at videos or or or, or whatever else she's doing in there. So yeah, I it's funny. I almost feel like LG's doing themselves a disservice in this in this view because I know they're showing a video editor and I get it, but I think most people look at it and they're like, well, is that two monitors? Because it's like the big video at the top and the editing controls at the bottom. What you may not realize is that that editing control at the bottom isn't a full monitor. It's bigger than a full monitor size, right? And the mm-hmm. video is taken up the top of it. So yeah, I, I think this is... I. I think we're going to get more and more of this as as displays yeah. are somewhat commoditized and USB-C has made it easier to daisy chain them uh, and Thunderbolt too, although this isn't Thunderbolt. Uh, I, I think we're going to see more of this kind of situation and, and to where what works for you is what you'll be able to do, not what monitor you can get. Well, mm-hmm. Thunderbolt, per- <laughs> Thunderbolt ports would work for me. Um, that aside, though, I, I do think that you know, I, I, I've thought about this for a while, that computer monitors are like little TVs. Um, they do a lot of other things. You can have multiple monitors. And when you're sitting at your workstation, you're probably, you could watch TV if you want, but you don't have to watch TV. But to have just different form factors going forward and it to not be this sort of like, oh, it's a TV, but for your computer, is is kind of cool and uh, i you know i'm i'm excited to see where these go well folks if you have a thought about this or anything else on the show uh and you want to email us here's our email address feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com an engineer from alibaba found the log for j vulnerability and reported it to apache on november 24th so that it could get patched before it became a problem although it is a huge problem anyway Uh, In response to that early identification, China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology has suspended its security partnership with Alibaba for six months because China passed a law in September requiring companies to report vulnerabilities immediately to the product makers, which happened, and then to a Chinese information sharing platform within two days. 
which did not happen. I think this may be getting misreported in some places as China punishing somebody for, for not telling them. Uh, it was for not following the rules. They're supposed to make this vulnerability available on this sharing platform. Now, I don't know why they didn't. Maybe they felt two days was too fast and, they, and this vulnerability was so bad they wanted to give it more time. But that's what happened. They didn't follow this rule about a two-day sharing. Anyway, Log4j vulnerability, which is called Log4Shell, is still making headlines, and it is still getting patched. And I thought we could use a look at some of the common questions and misconceptions about it. If you're seeing the headlines and you're like, what is this again? One of the biggest issues about Log4J is that it is everywhere. It's not unusual that something like this would get reused so much, but everybody needs logging, and this is a really good piece of code for logging. Developers don't write every piece of code from scratch, scratch. They frequently reuse blocks of code that have been shown to be fit for purpose. Log4j is a really big example of that. Need to log something? No need to write a logging tool. Use Log4j. That's not the controversial part of the story. Log4j is a really common component in software packages. It isn't in one place. That's one thing to remember when you're like, what's taking them so long to patch this? It's everywhere. Sometimes a Java package doesn't even list log4j as its dependency because it's one of the dependencies in the package of a dependency. So the Java package may say, here's the dependencies and log4j isn't on there because one of those dependencies has log4j and you don't go down. So you have to know it's there to patch it. And you might not know unless you dig in and look. 80% uh, of packages have log4j more than one dependency deep. Log4j is in fact present in more than 35,863 Java packages on the Maven Central repository where Java packages are collected and made available to devs. Those 35,000 packages are spread across millions of pieces of software. Not all of those packages are updated yet either. So you have to get the package updated in order to update the software that uses the package. It's certainly fun to embarrass big companies by naming them as vulnerable to Log4Shell, but the fact is it would save a lot of time to just list the servers out there that aren't. All servers log, and I would venture to say almost all servers use Log4j to do it, certainly a large number of them. For example, Google has 500 engineers going through the company's code looking for all instances and figuring out how to patch them. That's one thing. It's everywhere. The other is it's easy to exploit. Log4j looks at requests sent to a server and interprets them so it knows how to make a log entry. Let's say a Minecraft user is entering a command. It might be useful later to know what the real name of that user is. So why not have the log add that so you don't have to do a separate look at when you're troubleshooting? To do that, you could very easily have Log4j take a quick look at your server's directory. Maybe it's LDAP. Look up the username, pull in the associated real name, and put it in the log. That's not a privacy violation. This is all info already on the server. You're just arranging it to make it more useful later. Log4j allows any lookup or allowed any lookup to be parsed. That's where things went wrong. I don't guess it was designed that way, just that nobody thought about it being used that way. So they didn't put in a safeguard that limited the lookup. However, somebody finally did think of that. And once it was found out, if a user input being logged included a lookup to a malicious server, Log4j just resolved that like any other lookup. It's like, oh, you want me to look there? Great, that's where I'll look. Resolving that could then mean a malicious server didn't send a name associated with the username, but sent some Java code that was executed to install malware, a typical remote code execution attack. And from there, you do ransomware, reverse shells, botnets, etc. So what do you do? The answer is buy your sysadmin or developer a coffee or a beer or seven and thank them profusely, because this has to be done at the server end. Uh, and on your end, patch, patch, patch. Uh, keep an eye out for patches and, and look for the patch that's coming to whatever device you use. So not a ton to add here, except, you know, and you, and you went pretty deep into it, but this, this idea of it being one of the worst ones, you see quotes about this is the worst uh, vulnerability we've had in two decades or whatever. Um, it it really does come down to the very little effort for a lot of damage, a lot of potential damage. So uh, let's hope everybody gets patched and we're past this as soon as possible. And yes, somebody, at, at sys admins in our chat room, uh, already correcting me on things. I know I oversimplified stuff. I know there's a lot of servers that aren't Java out there, but I hope the point is taken. Like like 
it being widespread doesn't mean somebody dropped the ball. It just means, man, somebody figured out a vulnerability that nobody thought of ahead of time. Well, moving into car technology, Tesla's cars have a big old touchscreen in the center console that lets you access cabin controls, AC, put up maps for navigation, and select and play music. A lot of other cars have adopted the same idea, but Tesla was the first and arguably still has the biggest panel. About a year ago, the system added passenger play with Solitaire and Sky Force Reloaded as options something as a passenger you might want to play, which made it possible for a passenger in the car to play the game when the car was in motion because the driver wasn't playing, just the passenger or somebody in the back. However, the U.S. National Highway Traffic uh, Safety Administration is investigating now whether 580,000 Tesla drivers may be playing the game while the car is in motion and if that also distracts them. This past year, the administration received one complaint, just one, about passenger play from a retired reporter who discovered the ability worked for him as a driver with no passenger in the car. He said, hey, this is a bad idea, but just the one. Uh, there have been no reported injuries or crashes related to the feature, though. Yeah, it feels like the uh, the administration, the Traffic Safety Administration was like, huh, okay, some some guy decided that we have to investigate this. So we do, but I don't see anybody using this wrong. Like, sure, maybe somebody could, but it almost yeah. feels like in this particular case, people know like, yeah, don't play solitaire while you're actually driving, but let's not deprive the passenger of a little fun just because maybe somebody somewhere won't know that. Well, and you know, for anybody who's, you know, I've, it's not like I've been like in that many Tesla cars, but it is jarring if you're not used to that center panel. The first time you see it, you're like, what? It's huge. Like, let's use it. I can see as a passenger, you'd be like, I want all the options afforded to me. Obviously, the driver has to do other things. But uh, but yeah, it, it, it's not weird that you would have more and more, you know, like fun options like games for passengers. But uh, but yeah, it it. Nobody should be playing games while they're driving. But but again, it doesn't sound like that's what's going on here. No. Now, we had a big discussion about this on Core, the video game podcast I do. And me and my hosts were trying to get our heads around um, what you'd actually want in a car. And it always came down to, well, passenger, bored, and you're driving. So passenger, give them something to do. People in the back, give them something to do. These are all obvious uh, answers. And it already sort of exists in you know, slapdash ways like, you know, video players hanging on the back of seats for your kids or some built-in options for other cars. In this particular case, you're talking about such a technological platform for which you can build, then build on. The entire car is based around the idea that we're rethinking how all of this works. So why not that kind of, or those kinds of entertainment? And until the cars are like 99.99%, 100% proficient self-drivers when you're on a long haul drive to California, then we should probably talk about it because now that driver is going to be bored. We I, I foresee a day when we are we were truly letting the car do all the heavy lifting, and we're not having to keep our hands on the wheel. When that day, day comes, got to give that guy something to do, and I'm fine with that. I just don't think it's now. Yeah, that's all. I I think there's two issues here. One is oh, it's Tesla, so immediate headline and controversy. And two, that center panel is huge and in the middle. So I yeah. guess there is a fair question of. If I, the passenger, am playing uh, Sky Force Reloaded, does that distract the driver, right? Not because they're trying to play a game irresponsibly, but because it's right there, right? Uh, doesn't seem like that has been a complaint yet. It's only theoretical, but, you know, I guess maybe worthwhile to investigate. Well, if you um, hang out in VR like I do and you think, <laughs> I just wish my favorite celebrity also was hanging out in VR. Well, if you use the app Supernatural, you might be in luck because Supernatural is partnering with comedian Tiffany Haddish, uh, also an actress. Uh, you probably know her. She's very funny. To release a new workout series on the platform as part of its upcoming This Year Be You campaign, which will add four workouts for users featuring Haddish in 2022. It's worth noting that Within, and that's the parent company of Supernatural, 
is uh, in an ongoing FTC probe, which is looking into Meta's plan to acquire within. Now, that is sort of beside the point here. Uh, but, you know, it could make things a little bit messy in 2022. But I will say, as somebody who, um, you know, I'm a Supernatural fan. <laughs> you all know. <laughs> I can't stop talking about it. I love that app. It is so much fun. Um, but what you do get is, you know, it's it's the equivalent of going into your local gym and one of the coaches is leading a class, you know, and you got your favorite coaches and that's fun. That's great. Um, and they're all really great. Um, there is also a huge Supernatural Facebook community, um, the biggest that I've ever seen, really. Um, and you know, a lot of personal stuff from people that people add and share, you know, about weight loss or, you know, health uh, journeys or, you know, all, all of the reasons that they have decided to start this workout series. And uh, recently they actually had somebody from the community do like a one-off, like, okay, she's your coach for the day type thing. And it was a huge hit. And this was just sort sort of, you know, somebody who loved Supernatural and loved the community and was super active, you know, in the Facebook group and was sort of, you know, picked out as like a person to say like, okay, what if we kind of change it up a little bit? You know, are people still going to have a lot of fun? Huge success. So just the idea that this could also be like, somebody that you respect, you know, and think is funny or, you know, is, you know, in your favorite movie type thing. I think this, and again, you know, supernatural, I know I like, I, I, I don't want to be a spokesperson for it, you know, and I know I sound like that a, a, at times, but for all sorts of apps like this, uh, this is, this is, we're getting there. Yeah. Here's the thing I would say, you really want to get me, you get one of the, uh, you get one or both of the Winchester brothers from the television series, Supernatural. You get them on there. <laughs> so you get Jared Padalecki or that Jensen Ackles guy. And those are your two dudes. And now they're in Supernatural. That kind of, uh, you know, inception is where I'm coming from. That's what I want. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, please, please within take Scott's idea, go run with it while you yeah. can. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's check out the mailbag. Uh, we got a good one from Jerome. Jerome says, I have a handy email signature I'd like to pass along. I took the time to enter a signature for my email that is highly personalized. This is something that we're going to have on our show notes. I don't want to just say it out loud for Jerome's you know, privacy purposes. But Jerome says, my friends know if they don't see this signature, it's probably not for me. Spammers really can't do the individualization needed. Yeah, and, and we don't, won't even put Jerome's signature in, in the show notes, uh, but it has uh, a quote from Hobbes that he has kind of, you know, changed so that it's personalized. It has a thing about typos from Calvin with, and Hobbes, with actual typos. Uh, it... it it is, uh, it, it is, it is unique. And so the idea, you don't even have to really know what's in it, but the idea is that Jerome says, look, everybody sees my crazy, weird, unique signature. And if they don't see it, then immediate suspicion, because they'll get used to seeing it. He has it really big type too. So that like, it mm -hmm. stands out. I mean, it's not a silver bullet. Obviously, if somebody really wanted to get Jerome, they could take the signature and copy it and then fish his friends, but that's a pretty specific attack. So, you know, yeah. it's a, it's a nice speed bump along the way of making sure that at least people won't get fished by someone pretending to be Jerome very easily. Indeed. Uh, Jerome, uh, we like your gumption. Um, if anybody <laughs> has life hacks you'd like to share with us, please do send them our way. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also have some brand new bosses. We'd like to thank them right now. Paul Schmidt, Dave Gallo, Thomas Raphael all started backing us on Patreon. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you to you, Scott Johnson. Um, oh. We we also, you know, we clap for you always. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, look, uh, <laughs> I'm used to my own laugh track, my own clapping. All that stuff follows me everywhere I go. Not true. Uh, well, thanks for having me on. I always like yeah. to be on. And uh, if you're this Christmas going, man, you know what I'd really like for Christmas? I'd like a, a new podcast in 2022 that focuses entirely on nothing but retro gaming. 
Oh, boy, am I excited to tell you then. Your wish has come true. It's a Christmas miracle. Starting in January of 2022, uh, specifically the third, I'm launching a new show with my cohort, Brian Dunaway, called Retro Play. Or Play Retro, rather. We had to go the other way because someone else had the other one. Play Retro, (laughs) which you can find over at frogpants.com slash play retro. Nothing's up yet, but uh, the beginnings of all of it is there. We're all set to launch. And if you like retro video games, arcade stuff, NES, Super NES, all that old stuff, uh, we're really excited about this. So go check that out. Everything else can be found at frogpants.com, including my Twitter account, which is at Scott Johnson. Well, we always love to have you on the show. Speaking of our show, we only have one more live show this year, and that is tomorrow. Catch us then at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with OG DTNS producer Jenny Josephson and possibly more friends may pop up as well. Don't miss it. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)